Beloved in Christ, God's grace, mercy, and peace be with you. We are gathered here in a sanctuary this morning, and we are gathered in the sanctuary that is called C2, and we are gathered in your living room or hotel room or wherever you are this morning in the sanctuary that is the space in which you find yourself as you come to this time of worship. We gather in sanctuary, it's a wonderful word for a place, a holy place set apart for the worship of God, the praise of God, the thanksgiving of God, and to ask for God's mercy. Please join me this day as we pray together that God will come to be among us bearing good news. We thank you, Holy One, for this day you have made and all that is in it. We thank you that you have come to us through the life of Christ and that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you continue to accompany us, fill us, teach us, guide us, and grant us your peace. We thank you that you are opening our eyes to see and our ears to hear a fresh word today in a text we may have heard many, many times that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts might, might be an acceptable offering to you. For you, O oh God, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. When I was a little kid, long before Walt Disney grew up in Marceline, Missouri, and then made his way to Mickey Mouse fame, the greatest show on earth was the circus. How many of you have ever been to the circus? A few hands in the crowd. When Barnum and Bailey came to town, they hosted a fair with elephant rides for little kids. Somewhere in my childhood photo album, no, it's not on my phone, in those little plastic sleeves where you put those other those little photos, there's a photo of my best dar friend Darlene and me in our summer shorts, sitting high in the air on an elephant. And we're waving at our parents down below, or terrified that we're going to fall off. Personally, the favorite part for me of the circus were the acrobats, long before Simone Biles made uh, Olympic fame, right? They were spectacular, catching each other in the air on those trapeze and holding your breath in case they fell into the nets below. We humans love the sensational. We adore the fantastical. We always have as human creatures. Americans funniest home videos made us laugh when we watched some guy riding his bicycle across the ridge pole of the barn only to tumble headfirst into the pigsty. That's hysterical. I know some of you watch dog videos. I'm not going to ask who you are. <laughs> we watch social media clips um, that are called the last words of husbands as they shout, honey, watch this just before they ski off the third story of the house. We humans have a tendency to crane our necks at car accidents. They call us looky-loos. And we tune into the disaster stories on television that try to pass for news. We pay good money for the spectacle of the moment when it promises to make us happy, unite us in times of trouble, and give us hope for the future. A few weeks ago, I had really high hopes for five minutes that football might be finally the thing that unites our country and transcends our divisions as a nation. For those of you not interested or not paying attention, a whole bunch of folks kept watching the playoff games even after their team was eliminated from the series. How great is that? We rooted for the underdog, even if that team played opposite our favorite just a week before. And everybody was civil about the whole thing. For a heartbeat, I nearly traded in my clergy robe for a football jersey, Tampa. But then, <laughs> then there was a romance between Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift. Well, if it wasn't football, you would think that love would bring us all together when they kissed on the 50-yard line. Aww, but no. <laughs> Conspiracy theories launched about Swift rigging the games or mounting a platform for politicking or the embassy of Japan making sure her plane makes it back today. I haven't seen the morning news, so I don't know what's trending now. 
But you see, the world really loves a spectacle. And the world loves to give us a spectacle. Spectacles make big bucks. They demand something from us. They want our undivided devotion and attention for at least 90 seconds or 15 seconds if you're watching social media. They always have and they always will. A bargain Super Bowl ticket went for $6,000 this week. A young man was really happy about that. I thought that must be about six months rent where you live, buddy. And the going rate of $10,000 or above, I don't know. The spectacles of the world make us happy for a hot minute. But that happiness is always temporary. And when it doesn't last, we get mad, we get discouraged, we get depressed. Alternatively, the spectacular of God wants not just your 90 seconds, but your life. The spectacular of God brings us much more than fleeting entertainment. Our relationship with the holy gives us not just momentary happiness, but eternal joy. That's what the story, this familiar story of the transfiguration is really all about. When the disciples went up the mountain with Jesus, they experienced a spectacle unlike any the world had ever known. There were only three times in the practical, no-nonsense gospel of Mark when God lifts up the spectacle of Jesus, when something so fantastic happens, when Jesus, something has changed in form. First at the river, when Jesus emerged from his baptism, we get to overhear the voice of the Spirit descending into him. It appears to those watching like a dove, this is my beloved son. Today, up the mountain with Jesus at the Transfiguration, Peter and James and John saw him in clothing, dazzling bright, and then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice, not just to Jesus at his baptism, but now also to the collective follower of Jesus. That's all of us. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. And then finally, from the cross at Jesus' crucifixion, we hear the affirmation of the whole world as one of the Roman guards exclaimed, surely this man is the Son of God. In our spectacle-driven world, God says, listen up, turn off the noise. This is my Son, my beloved, listen to him, follow him. He is your way, your truth, your life. He will become for you a light shining in the darkness. He will be for you your peace beyond human understanding. He is my hope embodied for the world. Christ will be for you a sign that I love you and I am with you and I will be with you always no matter what happens to you. Even to the end of time, even when you mess up, you will be forgiven even when you are suffering, you will be set free. I will love you. I will be with you always. God knows we humans settle for what the world thinks is fantastic. To temporarily numb us from our troubles and the considerable challenges of our planet. God wants us to know that God's spectacles, God's spectacular, is so much bigger and so much exponentially grander than this. God promises us so much more than a moment's delight, however spectacular that might be. God promises and delivers a whole alternative way of being in the world. So when we see this transfigured that is changed in form image, then we become transformed. Transfigured, transformed means we're changed in our very being. Now this transfiguration may seem odd and like a one-off event or the store, a fanciful story, but over decades of ministry, many people have come to me over a long time with stories of transfiguration where they saw the presence of God in someone whose persona was changed. One woman, I think I've told some of you before, was at the funeral singing in the choir for one of her fellow choir members. And as she was singing, she saw her in the third row and the right wearing the dress that she always wore. 
when she sang in the choir. And at the memorial service afterwards, the daughter came up and said, did you see mom sitting in the third row? Did you see her there? This is a practical person. She's an accountant. You can count on accountants, right? They always tell the truth. <laughs> but you may have had an experience of the holy where you knew something was transformed, tr something was um, transfigured, changed in how it looked, and it changed you. It changed you. Now, such moments of this kind of seeing can be very rare. But even one such spectacular encounter changes us. And if we haven't had one, we trust the testimony of those who do. When we encounter the holy, we are transformed. We internally become someone new, reoriented to how we show up in the world. You remember that time when something spectacularly unexplainable happened to you that you undeniably knew was God. Or maybe your experience was more like the opening of the eyes to something you had not previously seen. Kind of like those ads on television for the shingles vaccine. You seen those? Where everybody has their eyes closed and then something long hidden wakes them up. I know it's a bad example, but you know what I'm talking about. For some of you, like the three disciples, entered, they entered uh, this relationship with Jesus, they were encountered by him up the mountain, and they had that moment that may have become a conversion from them, from the former way of life to a brand new way of being. Through such shared experiences of transformation, we affirm as a people of God all the time that if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation altogether. The old has passed away, the new has come. When we experience the holy, we are transformed. When we experience the transfigured, we are changed. The new life God promises, even in our chaos, is not unlike noticing that beloved across the crowded room when your heart starts to flutter and skip a beat. I recently read of one such story that took place decades ago. It was about an exchange student from Italy who uh, was in Eng England to learn the English language. And she found herself at Trafalgar Square one afternoon. And across the square on the courtyard, sitting between, between two uh, lions, as it turns out, was um, an American student who was there on vacation with his parents. Well, it, as if there was a beam of light between the two, for about an hour, just looking at each other across the square until they finally got together. A conversation lasted the day, and then the next day, and then the day after until the plane got ready to leave for the United States. He had to go back to school in California. Their long distance friendship evolved over time, but it took effort and attention, real work, finding each other before Facebook or before telephone, I guess if you are doing this, you're really old. This is what a telephone call looks like now. <laughs> Doggone it. <laughs> but eventually they were united a final time with a marriage that continues to endure to this day. One theologian describes the transfiguration as God's declaration of love for the Son. When we're in love, we can't get enough of each other. We can't wait to see one another again, and we miss one another when we're too long apart. One translation of today's passage is the voice of heaven proclaiming, this is my beloved, my son, in whom I take delight, in, to, in whom I take pleasure. Jesus loves us as God loves him, proclaiming our belovedness, delighting in us, wanting us to devotedly love him back. It's all forms of love, eros and agape love, all wrapped up in holy mystery. The season of Lent is upon us now. In three days, it will indeed be Ash Wednesday. The practices of Lent invite us to consider this question. To whom will we give our undivided devotion? To what will we give our total concern? On a daily basis, in what will we find our greatest delight, our heart's desire? 
For those of you who have raised Catholic, you know about uh, giving up something for Lent. You've had to teach the rest of us over time. The traditional practices of giving up something for Lent is not, though, about punishing ourselves by giving up something we truly love, beating ourselves up for what bad people we are. No, not at all. But rather, letting go of something in Lent is about refusing to punish ourselves any longer by clinging to a false spectacle of the world that cannot give us life. Let me say that again. Letting go of something in Lent is about refusing for a season, practice, to let go of punishing ourselves any longer by clinging to those false spectacles of the world that cannot ultimately give us life. The world faces significant challenges at this moment, to be sure. Our hearts ache with compassion for those legions who suffer for a variety of reasons. How often we say to one another, yes, I'm going through this really hard time right now, but I'm nevertheless so fortunate. While pain and sorrow are a part of all of our lives, much of what we suffer is voluntary. It's voluntary. We may not be able to fix every trouble, but we can avoid, we can let go of participating in the suffering of the circus. This takes a great deal of courage and commitment. It takes a great deal of courage and commitment for us individually, and it takes a great deal of courage and commitment for us as a church. Our purpose as a church is not to be liked. Now, I like to be liked. <laughs> There's no, no mistaking that. But we don't work really hard on our message and our music and our ministry week in and week out to be entertaining. We're not trying to create the most spectacular religious circus in town. We're here to embody the love of God for the world, not in order that you might like us better or like us on a Facebook post, although it's great if you do. But that's not the point. The point is that you love and follow Christ. The point is that you love and follow Christ as God's chosen one, holy and beloved, to what do you regularly give your devotion? As an experiment, I'm curious about what would happen if we were to let go of whatever is causing us right now to drift from God's love for us. It's going to be something different for all of us. You know what it is. It matters little if our attention goes to the daily news, that's the way you start your day, social media, our phones, <laughs> or that nightly scotch. Any good gift can become an addiction that seduces us away from our best life. Last week we talked about um, the difference between incremental change and transformational change. The practices of Lent are an incremental change to practice for a little while. What could stick as a transformational change or not, but it helps us to notice to what we give our greatest devotion. There's a country music song about a woman whose husband loves to fish. Lots of us love to fish. How many of you go fishing once in a while? A few of you in the crowd? Okay, you're not gonna tell the truth because you don't know what I'm gonna do with this story. <laughs> don't look to me to preach against fishing or football or I'm likely to find myself in the unemployment line but this particular woman experienced complete alienation from her husband who was no longer available to her. He cheated on her with a bucket of shrimp and a fishing pole. She finally gave him an ultimatum. Arrive home this certain night and spend some time with her or she'd be gone. Now he wants to better love his, his wife, he really does. He wants to want to love his life better. He wants to want to go home. But then, when he's just about to pull up his line, looky there, I got a bite. And the words and the refrain to that song are, I'm sure gonna miss her. <laughs> it 
This morning, we are giving our first and best attention to God. That pleases God enormously. And we're having a really good time at it. It's not like it's hard, you know, this is a great thing. We worship, we pray, we listen to the word, we have wonderful encouragement and inspiration from music. We've loved on God and on Jesus and on the Holy Spirit and on one another, and we'll keep doing that all the way through coffee hour. We give our first and our best to God. We know who we are and to whom we belong. We know what really gives us life, and that gives us joy. And then tonight, some of us are going to watch football. For a few hours, we'll give Kelsey and Taylor and McCaffrey and Shannon Han our attention, if only for 90 seconds. But I have to say, I learned to love McCaffrey and Shanahan when it was both of their fathers and the Broncos won the Super Bowl. But there it is. We'll give them a little bit of momentary attention. But we won't give them our life. We don't have to give them our life. You see, the endless spectacles that the world offers may give us temporary pleasure, and that's great. It's okay to have a good time. They simply can't be our God. The news can't be our God. The news feed in the morning can't be our God. It will just make us so miserable. Let it go. For this season of Lent, let go of whatever spectacle has captured your heart. Fast from whatever is causing you to drift from God and God's promises for your life. Resist settling for a one-night stand when the love of your lifetime is standing right in front of you. Here's Jesus, the beloved, the one who beloveds you back. Listen to him and live. May it be so. Amen.